Chapter 16, Dr. Seward's Diary, continued. It was just a quarter past twelve o'clock when we got into the churchyard over the low wall. The night was dark with occasional gleams of moonlight between the rents of the heavy clouds that scuttled across the sky. We all kept close together, with Van Helsing slightly in front as he led the way. When we had come close to the tomb, I looked well at Arthur, for I feared that the proximity to a place latent with such sorrowful a memory would upset him. But he bore himself quite well. I took it that the very mystery of the proceedings was in some way a counteractant to his grief. The professor unlocked the door, and seeing a natural hesitation amongst us for various reasons, solved the difficulty by entering himself first. The rest of us followed suit, and closed, he closed the door behind him. He then lit a dark lantern and pointed at the coffin. Arthur stepped forward hesitantly. Dr. Van Helsing said to me, You were here yesterday, with me. Was the body of Miss Lucy in that coffin? It was. The professor turned to the rest, saying, You here, and yet there is no one who does not believe with me. He took his screwdriver out and began again to take off the lid of the coffin. Arthur looked on, pale, but very mostly silent. When the lid was removed, he stepped forward. He evidently did not know that there was a leaden coffin, or at any rate had not thought of it. When he saw the rent in the lead, the blood rushed to his face for an instant, but as he quickly fell again, but as quickly fell again, so he remained a as a as a of a ghastly whiteness. He was still silent. Van Helsing forced back the leaden flange, and we all looked and recoiled. The coffin was empty. For several minutes, no one spoke a word. The silence was broken by Quincy Morris. Now, Professor, I answered for you. Your word is all I want. I wouldn't ask such a thing ordinarily. I wouldn't so dishonor you as to imply doubt. But this is a mystery that goes beyond any honor or dishonor. Is this your doing? I swear to you all that I hold sacred that I have not removed nor touched her. What happened was this. Two nights ago, my friend Seward and I came here with good purpose, believe me. I opened the coffin from which that was then sealed up, and when we found it as now empty. We then waited and saw something white come through the trees. The next day, we came here in daytime, and she laid there. Did she not, friend John? Yes. That night, we were just in time. One more so small child was missing, and we find it, thank God, unharmed amongst the graves. Yesterday I came here before sundown, for at sundown the undead can move. I waited here all night until the sun rose, but I saw nothing. It was probably that it was because I had laid over the clamps of those Dolek's garlic, for which the undead cannot bear, and other things which they shun. Last night... There was no exodus, so tonight, before sundown, I took away my garlic and other things, and if it is that we find this coffin empty, but bear with me. So far, there is so much that is strange. Wait you, you with me outside, unseen, unheard, and things much stranger as yet to be. So, here he shut the dark slit of, the lid of his lantern, now to the outside. He opened the door, and we filed out, he coming last and locking the door behind him. Oh, oh but it, was, it seemed fresh and pure in the night air after the terror of that vault. How sweet it is to see the clouds race by, and the passing gleams of the moonlight between the scuttling clouds crossing and passing, like the gladness and sorrow of a man's life. How sweet it was to breathe the fresh air that had no taint of death or decay, how humanizing to see the red lighting of the sky beyond the hill, and to hear far away the muffled roar that marks the life of a great city. Each in his own way was solemn and overcome. Arthur was silent, and was, I could see, striving to grasp the purpose and the intermeaning of the mystery. I myself tolerably patient, and half inclined again to throw aside doubt and accept Van Helsing's conclusions. Quincy Morris was phlegmatic in, in, in the way of a man who accepts all things, and accepts them in the spirit of cool bravery, with hazard of all that he has to stake. Not being able to smoke, he cut himself a good-sized plug of tobacco and began to chew. 
As to Van Helsing, he was employed in a, defi in a, def in a definite way. First, he took from his bag a mass of what looked like thin, wafer-like biscuits, which he carefully rolled up into his napkin. Next, out he took a double handful of some whitish stuff, like dough or putty. He began to crumble the, the wafer up fine and worked it in the, into the mass between his hands. He then then, he then then took and rolled it thin into thin strips and began to lay them into into the crevices between the door and the set and its settling in the tomb. I was somewhat puzzled at this and began to close, asking him what it was he was doing. Arthur and Quimsy drew near, also, as they too were curious. He answered, I am closing the tomb so that the undead may not enter. And is all that stuff you put in there gonna do it? asked Quincy. Great Scott, man, is this a game? It is. What is it which you are using? This time the question was, was by Arthur. Van Helsing reverently lifted his hat as he answered. Ah, the host. I brought it from Amsterdam. I have an indulgence. It was an answer that appalled the most skeptical of us, and we felt individually that, in the presence of such earnest purpose as the professor's, a purpose which could thus use the to him most sacred of things, it's impossible to distrust. In a respectful silence we took places assigned to us close round the tomb, but hidden from the sight of anyone approaching. I pity the others, except especially Arthur. I myself had been apprenticed to my former by my apprentice by my former visits to this watching horror, and yet I, who had been up an hour ago, repudiated the proofs, felt my heart sink within me. Never did the tombs look so ghastly white, never did Cypress or you or Juniper seem so the embodiment of funeral gloom, never did trees or grass waves or rustle so ominously. Neither did bow creak so mysteriously, and never did the far-off howling of dogs seem such a woeful presage throughout the night. There was a long spell of silence, a big, aching void, and then from the professor came a keen sss. He pointed, and far down the avenues of yews we saw a white figure advance, a dim white figure which held some something dark in its breast. The figure stopped, and at the moment a ray of moonlight fell upon the masses of driven clouds and showed in stark prominence a dark-haired woman dressed in the cerements of the grave. We could not see the face, for it was bent down over what we saw to be a fair-haired child. There was a pause, and a sharp little cry such as a child gives in sleep or a dog as it lies before the flame, fire in dreams. We were startled forward, but the professor's warning hand, seen by us as he stood behind a yew tree, kept us back, and then as we looked at the white figure move towards again. It was now near enough for us to see clearly, and the moonlight held still. My own heart grew cold as ice, and I could hear the gasp of Arthur as we recognized the features of Lucy Westenra. Lucy Westenra. But yet... How changed! The sweetness was turned into adamantine, heartlessly cruel, heartless cruelty, and the purity of voluptuous wantonness. Van Helsing stood out, and, obedient to his gesture, we all advanced too, the four of us ranged in a line before the door of the tomb. Van Helsing raised his lantern and drew the slide, but by the, by the concentrated light that fell on Lucy's face we could see that her lips were crimson with fresh blood and that the stream had trickled over her chin and stained the purity of her lawn death robe. We shuddered in horror. I could see by the tremendous light that even Van Helsing's iron reserve had failed. Arthur was next to me, and if I had not seized his arm and held him up, he would have fallen. When Lucy, I call the thing before us Lucy before it bores, before, because it bore her shape, saw us, she drew back an ang with an angry snarl, such as a cat gives when taken unawares. Then her eyes deranged over us. Lucy's eyes in form and color, but Lucy's eyes unclean and full of hellfire, instead of the pure, gentle orbs we all knew. At, the, at that moment, the remnant of my love passed into hatred and loathing. Had she had then been killed, I could have done it with a savage delight. 
As she looked, her eyes blazed with an unholy light, and the face became wreathed with a voluptuous smile. Oh, God, how it made me shudder to see it! With a careless motion, she flung to the she flung to the ground, Cassius as a devil, the child that was now that she had cautiously clutched strenuously to her breast, growling over it like a dog growls over a bone. The child gave a sharp cry and lay there moaning. There was a cold-bloodedness in the act, which wrung a groan from Arthur when she advanced to him with outstretched arms and a wanton smile. He fell back and hid his face in his hands. She still advanced, however, and with a languorous, voluptuous grace, said, Come to me, Arthur. Leave these others and come to me. My arms are hungry for you. Come, and we can rest together. Come, my husband. Come! There was something diabolically sweet in her tone, something of the tingling of glasses which struck, which rang through the brains of even us who had heard the words addressed to another. As for Arthur, he seemed to be under a spell, moving his hands from his face. He opened wide his arms. She leapt for them, when Van Helsing sprang forward and held between them a little gold crucifix. She recoiled from it, and with a sudden distorted face, full of rage, dashed past him as if to enter the tomb. With, when within a foot or two of the door, however, she stopped, as if arrested by some irresistible force. Then she turned, and her face was shown in the clear brust of the moonlight, and by the lamp, which would now no quiver from Dr. Van Helsing's iron nerves. Never did I see such baffled mass lalaths from on a face, and never, I trust, shall ever see something like that again by mortal eyes. The beautiful color became livid. The eyes seemed to throw out sparks of hellfire. The brows were wrinkled as though the folds of the flesh were the coils of Medusa snakes, and the lively blood-stained mouth grew to open square, to an open square, as if in the as if the passion marks of the passion mask of the Greeks and the Japanese. If a face meant death, if looks could kill, we saw it at that moment. And so for a full half a minute, which seemed an eternity, she remained between the lifted crucifix and the sacred closing of her means of entry. Van Helsing broke the silence by asking Arthur, Answer me, friend, my oh, my friend! Am I pr to proceed in my work? Arthur threw himself on his knees, and hid his face in his hands. He answered, Do as you will, friend. Do as you will. There can be no horror like this ever any more. And he groaned in spirit. Quincy and I simultaneously moved towards him and took his arms. We could hear the click of the closing lantern as Van Helsing held it down. Coming close to the tomb, he began to remove from the chinks some of the sacred emblems which he had placed there. We all looked on in horrified amazement as we saw, when he, when he stood back, the woman, in a corporeal body as real as the moment of our own, passed through the intersections where scants a knife blade could have gone. We all felt a glad sense of relief when we saw the professor calmly restore the strings of putty on the edges of the door. When he was done, he lifted the child and said, Come now, my friends. We, have, we can do no more until tomorrow. There is a funeral at noon, so here we shall come before that, before long after that. The friends of the dead will be all gone by two, and when the sexton lock of the gate we shall remain. And there is more to do. But not like this, of the, not like this of tonight. As for this little one, he is not much harm. But by tomorrow, he shall be well again. We shall leave him where the police will find him, as of the other night, and then to home. Coming close to Arthur, he said, "My friends, Arthur, you have had a sore trial. But after, when you look back, you will see how it was necessary. You are now in the bitter waters, my child. But by this time tomorrow, you will." Please, God, have passed through them and have drunk in these feet waters. Do not mourn over much. Till then, I shall not ask you to forgive me. Arthur and Quimsy came home with me, and we tried to cheer each other up on the way. We left the child in safety and were tired, so we all slept in more or less re with more or less reality of sleep. 29th of September, night. 
A little before twelve o'clock, we three, Arthur, Quincy Morris, and myself, called for the professor. It was odd to notice that by common constants we had all put on black clothes. Of course, Arthur wore black, for he was still in deep mourning, but the rest of us wore it by instinct. We got to the churchyard by half past one and strolled about, keeping out of the official observa- keeping out of official observation, so that we and so when the grave diggers had completed their task, the sexton, under the belief that everyone had gone, had locked the gate. We could have the place to ourselves. Van Helsing, instead of his little bag with him, he had a long leather one, something like a cricketing bag. It was a, ma- a manifestation of fair weight. When we were alone and had heard the last of the footsteps die outside the road, we silently, and as if ordered intent by an ordered intent, followed the professor into the tomb. He unlocked the door, and we entered, closing it behind us. Then he took from his bag the lantern which he lit, and also two wax candles which, when lit, he struck by melting their ends on the other coffins, so that it might give the light sufficient to work by. When he again lifted the lid of Toot Lucy's coffin, we all looked. Arthur trembled like an aspen, and saw the body that laid there in all of its deathly beauty. But there was no love in my own heart, nothing but loathing for the foul thing that which had taken Lucy's shape without her soul. I could even see Arthur's face grow hard as he looked. Presently, when he said to Van Helsing, Is this really Lucy's body? only a demon in her shape? It is a body, and yet is not. Wait a while, and you will see her as she was, and is. Seemed like a nightmare of Lucy's as she lay there. The pointed teeth, the blood-stained voluptuous mouth, which would make one shudder to see. The whole carnal and unspiritual appearance seemed like a devilish mockery of Lucy's purity. Van Helsing, in all his usual meticulousness, began to take out the various contents of his bag and placing them for ready use. First he took out a soldering iron and some plum and, a, and some plumbing, plumbing solder, and then a small oil lamp which gave out, when lit in the corner of the tomb, gas which burned a fierce heat from with a blue flame. Then his operating knives, which he had placed to hand, and at last a round wooden stake some two and a half to three inches thick and about three feet long. One of it, it was hardened by the char of a fire and was shaped to a fine point. With this stake came a heavy hammer, such as in households would use in coal cellars to break the lamps. To me, a doctor's preparation for work of any kind are stimulated and bracing, but the effect of these things on both Arthur and Quimsy uh, was, was to cause them some sort of consternation. They both, however, kept their courage and remained silent and quiet. When all was ready, Van Helsing said, Before we do anything, let me tell you this. It is out of law and experience of the ancients and all of those things who have studied the powers of the undead. When they become such, they, it comes with the change, the curse of immortality. They cannot die, but must go on age after age, adding new victims and multiplying the evils of the world. For all that die from the praying of the undead becomes themselves undead and prey upon their kind. And so the circle goes ever widening, like the ripples from a stone thrown in the water. Friend Arthur, if you had met the kiss for which you know of before poor Lucy died, and again last night when you opened your arms to her, you would in time, when you had died, become Nosferatu as they call it in Eastern Europe, and all of the make more of those undead so that they would fill us with horror. The career of this also unhappy dear lady is but just begun. Those children whose blood she suck are not yet of not so much for worse, but if she live but if she live on, undead, more and more they lose their blood, and by her power over them they come to her, and are so drawn their blood with that so wicked mouth. But if she die in truth, then all cease. The tiny wounds in their doors disappear, and they go back to their plane, unknowing that is what has ever happened to happen to them. But of the most blessed of all, then now this undead be made to rest as true dead, then the soul of the poor woman we all love shall again be free. Instead of working wickedness by night and growing more debased in the assimilation by say. She shall take her place with the other angels. 
so that, my friends, it will be a blessed hand for her, so that we strike down the blow to bring Seta free. To this I am willing, but is there none amongst you who have a better right? Will it be no joy to think of hereafter in the silence of the night when the sleep is not? It was not. It was my hand that sent her to the stars. It was my the hands of him that loved her best. The hand of all she should have chosen. Had it been better her choice? Tell me if there's one amongst you, for among us to do such. We all looked at Arthur. He saw too what we all did. The infinite kindness which suggested that he should be the hand which should restore Lucy to us as a holy and not an unholy memory. He stepped forward and said bravely, though his hand trembled and his face was pale as snow. My true friend, from the bottom of my broken heart, I thank you. Tell me what I am to do, and I shall not falter. Van Helsing laid a hand on his shoulder and said, Brave lad, a moment's courage and it is done. This stake must be driven through her. It will be a fearful ordeal, be not deceived in that, but it will be only be a short time and your will will then rejoice much more that your pain was great. From this grim tomb you will emerge as though you tread on air, but you must not falter for once you have begun. Only then, only think of what we, your true friends, round you, and we pray for you all the same. Uh, go on, Arthur said Arthur hoarsely. Tell me what I'm to do. Take this stake in your left hand. Ready to place the point over the heart and hammer with your rights. And when we begin our prayer for the dead, I shall read him. I have here the book, and the other shall follow. Strike in God's name, so that all may be well with the dead that we love, and that the undead pass away. Arthur shook the stake, took the stake and the hammer, and when, and when once his mind was set upon action, his hands never trembled, not even quivered. Van Helsing opened his missile and began to read, and Quincy and I followed as well as we could. Arthur then placed the point over the heart, and as it looked I could see the dent of the white flesh. And then he struck with all his might. The thing in the coffin riled, and a hideous, blood-curdling screech came from the open red lips. The body shook and quivered and twisted in wild contortions, the sharp white teeth champed together till the lips were cut and the mouth was smeared with a crimson foam but arthur never faltered he looked like a figure of thor as he with his untrembling arm rose and fell driving deeper and deeper the mercy bearing stake whilst the blood from the pierced heart welled and spurted all around his face was set and his duty seemed to shine through it all the sight of it gave us courage, so our voices seemed to ring out through the little vault. And then the writhing and quivering of the body became less, and the teeth seemed to champ, and the face began to quiver. Finally, it lay still. The terrible task was over. The hammer fell from Arthur's hand. He reeled and would have fallen had we not caught him. The great drops of sweat sprang from his forehead, and his breathing came in broken gasps. It had indeed been an awful strain on him, and had not been, and had he not been forced not forced to his task by more human consternations, he never would have gone through with it. For a few minutes, we were so taken up with him that we did not look into the coffin. When we did, however, a murmur of startled surprise ran from one to the other. We gazed so eagerly at Arthur that Arthur rose, for he had been seated on the ground, and came and looked too. A glad, strange light broke over his face and dispelled all the gloom of horror that laid upon it. There, in the coffin, no longer lay the foul thing that we had so dread and grown to hate that the work of her destruction was yielded as a privilege to the one best entailed to it. But Lucy, as we had seen her in life, with her face unequaled of sweetness and purity, true that they were there, we had seen them in life, the traces of care and pain and waste, but they, these were all dear to us, for they marked her truth for what we knew. One and all, we felt the holy calm that laid like sunshine over the wasted face and foam was only an earthly token and symbol of the calm that was to reign forever. 
Van Helsing came and took his hand on Arthur's shoulders and said, And now, Arthur, my friend, dear lad, am I not forgiven? The reaction of the terrible strain came as he shook the old man's hand in his and raised his lip and pressed it, saying, Forgiven! God bless you that you had given my dear one her soul again, and me peace. He put his hand on the professor's shoulder, and laying his head on his breast, cried for a while silently, while still unmoving. When he raised his head, Van Helsing said to him, And now, my child, you may kiss her. Kiss her dead lips, if you will, as if she would want you to, if for her to choose. For she is not a grinning devil now, no more any more a foul thing for all eternity. No longer is she the devil's undead. She is good, true dead, whose soul is with him. Arthur bent and kissed her, and then we sent him and Quincy out of the tomb. The professor and I saw the top of the stake, leaving the point of it in the body. Then we cut off the head and filled the mouth with garlic. We sought out the latent coffin, screwed on the coffin lid, and gathered up our belongings, came away. When the professor locked the door, he gave the key to Arthur. Outside, the, the air was sweet, the sun shone and the birds sang, and it seemed as if all of nature had turned tuned to a different pitch. There was gladness and mirth and peace everywhere, for we were at rest ourselves on one account, and we were glad, though it be a temper to joy. Before we moved away, Van Helsing said, Now, my friends, one step of our work is done, one the most harrowing to ourselves, but there remains a greater task, to find the author of all this sorrow and stamp him out. I have clues for which we can follow, but it will be a long task and a difficult one, and there is danger in it, and pain. Shall you not help me? Shall you not all help me? We have learned to believe, all of us, is that not so? And so, since, do we not see it our duty? Yes! And do we not promise to go to the bitter end? Each in turn we shook his hand, and the promise was made. Then the professor said as we moved off, Tonight hence you shall meet with me and dine together at seven on the clock with friend John. I shall entreat two others, two who you've now not yet know yet, and I shall be ready to all of our work show and our plans unfold. Friend John, you come with me home, for I have much to consult with about, and you can help. Tonight I leave for Amsterdam, but I shall return tomorrow night and then begin our great quest. At first I shall ha I have much to say so that you may know what it is but must do and to dread. Then our promise shall be made to each other anew, for there is a terrible task above us. And once our feet are on the plock's share, we must not draw 